Welcome back, everybody. Uh, gonna jump back into kind of an old routine of questions, and part of the reason is because I'm extremely behind on it. So I appreciate everyone's patience with stuff. I I have done a much better job of keeping up with Instagram. So if you're if you're listening to this and you're looking to send a message, uh, Instagram is tends to be a quicker response for me um, than Facebook. Facebook, I'm, I'm way behind on. It's not that one's better than the other. It's just I I have run short on time when it comes to responding to some of the questions. So emails, um, I'm behind on emails as well, but not nearly as bad as I am Facebook. So I'm jumping into Facebook right here because I've set aside a couple hours today um, and kind of committed to try to get caught up. I'm not going to be able to get caught up in a couple hours on Facebook stuff. But when I say that, it's a I don't feel good about it. But I also feel like, man, it's really a, a positive thing that people feel that comfortable reaching out with questions. So I want you to know that I appreciate that. And I'm begging for your forgiveness, I guess, with my tardiness on response. But I'm doing the best I can. Um, we've got a lot of projects going internally, which I'm pretty excited about. So that is um, part of the issue. It's just you guys, I'm sure, can relate. Like life gets really busy. So um Hang with me. Be patient. I don't mind you sending a, a reminder, especially if you sent it quite a while ago. Uh, it helps to get back up on top of the list. Um, just don't be a jerk about it. I've had a couple people be jerks about it, and I, that's a quick way to not come. <laughs> I, I, I misplaced those ones pretty easy. So I, I don't I don't want to make excuses for, for um, my inability to be really responsive, but I'm doing the best I can. So um, I've got this. This is a question that it, it's the it's on the top of Facebook, so it's, I'm probably the opposite of what I should be doing it. But they came in recently. I'm going to respond. I'm going to start working my way through it. It says, uh, I have a quick question. I'm getting an eight-week-old Australian Shepherd Blue Healer mix in a few days. Hopefully going to look to recover deer with. I just ordered your puppy training video, first things first. Should arrive April 1st. After we get our basic obedience done, should we jump into getting her familiar with the scent or should I introduce it while we're doing basic obedience? Thanks for your time. I'm not going to give you a specific answer, Joey, because there is no specific answer. What I want you to take away from this is don't look for step-by-step -step instructions in training dogs. So what do I mean by that? I've got an English setter puppy here, Makina. We just started uh, a series with her. I'm really having a fun time with her. She's about five months old really enjoying the process, learning an awful lot myself, probably studying more than I've studied for anything related to dog training before. And what I'm taking away from it is, so I, I'm putting myself in your guys' shoes in, for, for a lot of you, is you're listening to this probably to get more information. You watch hopefully our YouTube stuff to gain more information. Our training DVDs, which it sounds like this guy ordered the puppy one. My recommendation is do that. Watch the puppy one. You're going to have an eight-week-old puppy. A lot of that puppy video, which is available digitally as well as DVD, you can apply right away. You will apply because that's sequentially how we filmed it. We filmed it to be maybe the first couple months where my focus is heavily on, not exclusively, but very heavily. Sequentially, we filmed foundation, a foundation video. It's called First Things First, uh, or no, Puppies is First Things First. Foundation is building a solid foundation. So the second video follows in sequence, not step one, step two, step three, it's the idea of, it's kind of the next phase. It's what I'm gonna do with that puppy when it's four, five, six months old, maybe up till it's a year to two years. Now, a year to two years, that's a big window. And the reason I say it that way is because I mean it. Like, I have Makina right now, who is a little pointing dog, who is, I've not, she's not, I've not put her on any birds yet. So I know some people, and some of the things that I've read, and some of the things that I've watched, would say, I should have done this, should have done some of that stuff a long time ago. When I say a long time ago, I've only had her for three months. So yeah, but I mean it. Like a, two months ago is a long time in relationship to how long I've had the dog. So, and, and how long the dog's been alive. It's half of her life. So some of the stuff I've seen would say, no, don't worry about it. Uh, you've, got, you've got months before you need to worry about that stuff. You need to do this, this, and this ahead of time. I'm a believer in the idea of things in training are linked together like chains. So specifically to your answer, I don't care. Uh, you could introduce scent to a puppy that's eight, nine weeks old. I don't know that you see a bunch of benefit off of it. I don't know that it hurts you unless you have an unrealistic expectation of you're developing a tracking dog at eight or nine weeks old. You're not. 
So are there a lot of ways to do it? For sure. Is there a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it? I think there are some things that you can do that create issues. I think there are some things that you can do that'll be beneficial. So I, I'm not going to give you this step-by-step -step answer. I think what you need to do is you need to look at figuring out how to A, build the links individually, and then B, connect them to the one that is prior and behind it. So in front of and behind it, I should say. So that's how you create a length, lengthy chain that becomes a tool that works for something. So I think you need to completely focus on puppy stuff, which the puppy video, for me, it's always, I can always tell people where I start. Um, it's getting them settled into my house and making sure they don't go to the bathroom in the house. That's first and second. It's always. Then from there, I want them to get used to the crate. I think the crate is an integral part of the house breaking. So they're both valuable things. Don't have accidents in my house and be able to be put in a kennel without making a fuss. Like those are both very powerful things and important things. Individual and one works with the other. The crate helps the dog understand that he shouldn't go to the bathroom there. So you can dig into that and you'll dig into that in the video. Place training is one that I connect in there too. I don't know that there's a do this first, then go to place training. I do it all. I do a lot of it overlapping. Um, someone asked me the other day, and I, I th thought it was a good idea. I haven't had a chance to respond to it. I read it, but I wasn't able to respond to it. But they questioned, they asked me about like, do you think that, I think their question was, do you think that training is look at like, it was some type of description of um, circular where it would be like you're drawing a circle and you're slowly advancing the circle, but a lot of times the circle crosses over the line. Like if you take a pen and you start drawing squiggly marks, you go out and then come back around, out and come back around, out and come back around, but you're constantly moving in one direction, forward, let's say. But you your arc comes back over every time. So if you can envision that. I thought, well, that, that makes sense. I always look at it this way as we take a couple steps forward and then usually a couple steps back and then a couple steps forward and then a couple steps back. And it's this, it's this chipping away at stuff. Instead of trying to take real big jumps at once, we get bogged down that way. So instead we, you know, chip, 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 and probably get knocked back a little bit. Chip, 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 get knocked back a little bit. So you're building on very small little incremental steps and then occasionally you might realize I have to go back a little bit further to get to be moving forward again. I think that is the way it goes usually. So with, with the idea of whether it's circular or whether it's chipping away steps forward, steps back, I think the important thing is that you're constantly moving. I, I think that the problem comes is when we stop, when we're, when we're standing still, when we're not doing anything, nothing is being gained and maybe things are being lost. So I want you to, Take Joey, I'm going to send you a message that we're, we're hitting on this podcast and it's going to go pretty quickly because I think the guys need to put a fresh one up. So um, I'm filming this on a Tuesday. It'll probably go live by Wednesday. So <clears throat> I really think, Joey, y yes and no, and you figure out when. And so a lot of times, the, the, uh, I'll move on to the next question because I, I do get bogged down on stuff, but a lot of the times... I think that we are looking for, with some of these questions that I get, the beauty of me not answering them right away sometimes is before I even get to answering it, I get a second message from that person and they say, never mind, I found it. Never mind, I saw you did a podcast on it. Never mind, I read this and I saw that video that you did and that answered my question. And so inadvertently, I've also had some people say, never mind, it worked itself out. I fit, we tried this and it did this and the dog responded well. So I think we're through that or we're moving, we, we're able to move forward. Inadvertently, by me not jumping there to hand it off. I've had some people ask me like, what episode and at what point in the episode should I find out about this information? Because I've said, you know, sometimes my answers have been, yeah, I cover that. I talk about that in the series, Bella, be good, blah, 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 blah. They say, well, what episode? And where in the episode? And I, I respond back and I go, it's time to put the big boy pants on. You got to go look for it. Like, I can't just spoon feed you answers. It won't be impactful. So what I, what I think is a lot of times by delaying response, 
it's really the best thing that can happen because it forces some, some are proactive with it and just they continue to search and they continue to try. Some people freeze and if you freeze, you're, you're, you're dead in the water. So I do think that trying stuff, I had a conversation with my buddy last night and we said one of the things that is risky for him and I as new trainers of English setters, so pointing, style, pointing dog style training, we're new to it. We're not real familiar with it. And one of the worst things that we feel we can do is just be paralyzed because we overanalyze everything. Like we're really worried about this and that and this and that. So we don't do anything. Well, that, that's, we both know that, that that's the worst thing that we can do. Like you can't, you're not going to get any. So try something. And if it doesn't work, try something else. And I do think that part of good training and part of me being able to help people become better trainers is empowering them a bit to have some confidence to give something a chance because I do that all the time. I try stuff. I did it today with Chief. Chief is back for a week with me and I tried a few things and they went really well. You'll see this on video. It went really well until the wheels came off and then all of a sudden he just fell apart and I went, well, now what do I do? I could have ended it short and felt really good about myself I didn't, I pushed on a little bit and I realized it's nowhere, he's nowhere near where I want, where I thought he might be or wanted him to be. And I could have also been very frustrated and, and not sure how, where to, how to recover from that. But instead we, tr I tried several things and the first two or three didn't work. And again, put yourself in, in that position where you're trying something that doesn't work. It's very easy to get frustrated. It's very easy to blame the dog. It's very easy to, to be short. I, it's, it's magnified when there's two guys with a camera filming you. It's probably going to be a really valuable episode for some people because they're going to see that my dogs don't do stuff right all the time. I've, I've watched a lot of stuff lately, uh, particularly about pointing dogs, and I'm seeing a lot of really good things. And then I'm recognizing that my dog doesn't do all those good things all the time. And I'm having to figure out, well, what is it something I'm doing or is it, and I don't think it is. I think it's reality. And I think that the stuff that I'm finding that's available for instruction is very, very um, highlighty. It's very like, I'll show the good stuff. And I'm not faulting anyone for that. I don't, I'm not saying you're bad for doing it. I'm saying it gives me an idea of what I'm, what I'm striving for, but it's not really helping me figure out how to get there. And so I'm experimenting with stuff. I'm not quitting when it doesn't go good. I'm not getting frustrated. I'm not, uh, I am getting frustrated, but I'm not getting frustrated and allowing it to negatively affect my relationship and development with Makina. So with you, Joey, don't look for the answers to be given to you step by step. Instead, realize there's so many ways to do it. Experiment. So yeah, you could familiarize her with some scent early on, or you could wait. It really doesn't matter. It's up to you. What needs to happen, I do believe first, is that foundation. And you're talking about it already with the basic obedience. So take the pressure off yourself. Don't put any timelines on this stuff and just start moving forward. Okay, that, let's see, next question here. Working hard on heel with a 16-month-old golden and doing well. Your online content has helped a lot. Tight turns are coming a long way. But I have an issue as we approach our yard coming back from walks, he bolts. I try to correct as the leash tightens and since he is about to bolt and he goes from zero to 100, jumping, yelling, jumping and yelling at corrections. I'll put him in sit for a minute and calm down. And a second, the second I take another step, it's bolt trying to get back to the grass again. I have no idea what's driving his desire to get to the yard. It's every single time on the walk, I'm giving every firm, I'm giving a very firm, sharp correction with a prong collar and it does nothing. He's like possessed pup in another state of mind fighting to get to the yard. Obviously, I don't want to blow up. It's not good for anyone. Ideas to curtail the behavior. Have you seen this before with a particular spot in any dogs you've worked with in the past? This is from Eric. Here's what I think about this. First off, I the idea of, ideas to curtail this behavior. That's treating the symptom. 
I'm not big on treating the symptom. So will you have to do something at a certain point? Yes. But now my, my approach to fi figuring this out. So let me summarize it. Guy takes the dog for, a, this is how I read it. Guy takes the dog for a walk. Sounds like it's doing pretty good. Then he gets coming back toward the house. And as soon as the dog gets close to the yard, the dog freaks out, wants to get back in the yard, lunges, runs, uncontrollable. He's putting major correction and pressure on the dog and the dog's not responding. He gets the dog to sit for a second or two, but the second he takes a step, it's repeat again. Dog's going, running for the house, running for the yard. So here's what I think. You're looking to find out how do you curtail the behavior? I look at it and I go, why is the behavior happening? What leads to the behavior? When does it happen? How can I avoid it in the first place? or minimize its effects so that I can make a correction that's a little more mild. I don't think you need, so I, personally, I think there's some mechanical things here. Sharp corrections with prong collars, I don't think are good. So I would stop the situation. What I wouldn't do is continue to go for the walks like I go on and then come back and have the dog do it again. Like doing something over and over and over and expecting things to change, it's insanity, I think. That's the definition, I believe. That's what everybody says anyway. You're not going to change behavior by doing the exact same thing. So why is the dog doing it? I don't know. I'd have to, you'd have to see this. But what I would do is instead of going for the walk and then coming back and then bracing myself and getting ready to put a lot of pressure on the dog for doing what I know he's going to do because he's done it every time for the last however many times, is instead of that, I change the stuff that led up to it. So when I leave the, so let's break it down. You leave the yard, he's good. You start coming back, he gets within so close to it, and he's not good. Okay, so now what I do is, when I go, I leave the yard, and I shrink everything up. So I walk out, let's say, let's envision this as a yard with a sidewalk. I don't know if you're in the country, I don't know if you're in the city, I don't know what your setup looks like, but I'm going to make some assumptions. You're in, the, you're in town, you walk down your driveway, there's a sidewalk that goes through the neighborhood. You leave the neighborhood or you leave your yard. So you get on the sidewalk, you start to walk, you walk past your yard, you literally take three or four steps before the neighbor's next driveway. You're three or four steps beyond your yard. You're outside of your yard. I would stop, turn around and walk back. I might walk all the way past my house and go the opposite direction. I might go three or four steps beyond the driveway, go back to the other neighbor's house, neighbor on the right-hand side this time, and I walk past their yard, three, four, five, six, seven steps, turn around, stop, walk back past my yard, I go past the left house, might go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps, turn around, go back, and I would see what happens to the dog. If the dog responds to this normally with no issues, I'd keep doing it. And then I'd get to the point where I'm maybe halfway across the neighbor's yard. So you might be 15, 20 steps, you might be a little ways from your yard. I'd stop, I'd turn around and see what the dog does. If the dog, if the dog freaks out, I'd turn around and go the opposite way. And then I'd, but I, what I would do is, depending on how the dog's responding and reacting to this, is gonna dictate my pace and energy level. If the dog's on the pins and needles and ready to explode, I'm gonna take about one step at a time and I'm gonna stop every time. I mean, I might slow this thing right down to molasses really, really countering what the dog thinks he wants to do. You've got something probably in the dog mentally is hitting this panic button or whatever it is, or excitement button or whatever, it, whatever the thing is, it's tripping the dog. I'm going to start to figure out how to numb that up a little bit. And I'm going to be real extreme with it. So I always tell people, don't be extreme, get in the middle. Don't be far left. Don't be far right. Be somewhere in the middle. That's, that's the sweet spot. That's where I really want to be. So if the dog is, to me, panicking at 25 yards or 30 yards or eyesight, 50 yards, 100 yards, whatever it is, wherever that point is where you know it's coming, you've said it, you know that's boiling up, you know it's going to explode, you can't put enough pressure on to turn it off. You're trying with prong collars and lots of pressure and I, don't, I just don't think, I think that's silly, I don't think it's necessary. So what I'm going to do is, well before that point, I'm going to counterbalance it. So I'm going to, I'm going to work my way to that point slowly. If the dog wants to go fast, I'm going to go slow. 
If the dog is like dragging its feet and super, super slow and subdued and kind of sluggish, then I'm going to speed up a little bit. And so I'm going to, you might look like a real, real strange person in the neighborhood. They, they're lost. They just keep walking past their house back and forth with the dog. Let the neighbors talk. Let, explain to them what's going on. But what I want to do is forget about that and focus on reading my dog and understanding, starting to understand or try to figure out what is it and why. So I'm just going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I might, this is that idea of taking little bites, little peck away, peck away, peck away, and then go back. Peck away, peck away, peck away, go back. Where you're going to just imagine yourself digging through a cave. Like you're, you're digging through a mountainside. You're, you're, you're making a tunnel through a mountain. So you can't just keep digging, 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 digging. And you can't take big chunks out. You got to dig, 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 and then get the fill out of there. Dig, 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 and get the fill out. Dig, 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 and get the fill out. So you're going to, you're going to peck away at one, two, three steps, turn around and go back. One, two, three steps, go around, back. And just keep adding to it, going back and forth. And it's not going to get fixed in one day. You're not going to all of a sudden have this cured. That's what I would do to start out with. That's, that's one technique I would use to start out with. I'd see how that goes. But the whole idea in general is don't, don't do the same thing over and over and over again and just figure out how to, you know, in your words, ideas to curtail the behavior. Don't allow it to happen in the first place. That's the best way to avoid it. And so work to fix whatever it is before you get to that point. And so that's one of the ways I would, I would start tackling that. So Eric, I'm going to send you a message. Uh, let me know how things go on it. Um, uh, let's see this one. Now, I haven't even read this one. Hello, I've been watching your seminars and listening to your podcast. We're bringing home a bloodhound puppy April 2nd to train for deer recovery. I'm considering training for shed hunting also. My question is, would you recommend, along with your puppy fundamentals also, of course, starting her training for blood tracking and then add in shed hunting afterwards or incorporate both shed and blood tracking training together? I don't want to confuse or overwhelm her as blood tracking will be her main job. We would shed hunt in the off season. And this is from Megan. Megan, it's a little bit back towards the first question we talked about. It, but we've also talked about this in other podcasts, and there's there's stuff that you can dig into too. I'm going to send you a message as well. Don't start thinking about this thing as compartmentalized training. Foundation will be first. Overlap and layer in training as necessary. The idea of retrieving is different than tracking, but tracking and training and retrieving can be tied together because dogs that like to retrieve now the bloodhound might not have nearly the retrieve drive that some of the other breeds do but if your dog likes to retrieve stuff which all a lot of breeds do i like the idea of tying two things that are positive together the idea of use your nose and find something and then have it be a tennis ball at the end with some blood trail scent on it and then the idea of ice, icing on the cake is i get to pick it up and bring it back to dad and he'll throw it for me again so that's tracking, that's shed training. You could put an antler, you could put antler scent on the same tennis ball. Like you can do all these different things that are going to build up the dog's toolbox, if you will, of giving him some education and some skill. And then you're going to take that and apply it based on the calendar. Like right now is shed season. So if I've got a young dog that I want to shed hunt with and I want a blood trail with, and the dog, let's say is, I don't, I don't care what the age is, six months to 12 months or six months to two years old, let's say. If you're looking to do both of those things with the dog, let's say it's six months old. Well, it was too young to track last fall. Like it was, it was a puppy. It was, you know, two to three months old. You couldn't do anything with it. It's still a puppy at six months old, but I think you can take a dog out shed hunting without a lot of risk early. I had this question yesterday too about, and I messaged someone, I think Ben's going to turn it into a, a Jeremy journal entry, but it was a question about, can I take my, I really want to take the dog shed hunting. And I know you said, don't take dogs hunting early. I never said, don't take shed dogs hunting early. I said, take shed dogs with realistic expectations. I don't think you can take gun dogs and bird dogs and upland dogs. I should say upland dogs, flushing dogs 
and gun dogs, which are going to work waterfall and, and need, need a lot of things in place to have a successful hunt. I don't, I think you're risking too much to take those dogs early. So I think there is a lot of concern with that. Shed hunting, on the other hand, I don't think you, you, you're taking them for a walk is what you're doing. You're exploring. Now, I think you run into risks if you go too long with and, and get the dog into a bad position physically. I think mentally and physically, I should say. You want to keep them engaged. So I don't think it's a good idea to take your kids musky fishing for the first time to introduce them to the sport of fishing. Like, don't don't wear them out. Don't bore them. Don't, don't get them to the point where they go, this is ridiculous. I don't even want to be here right now. Instead, I would, you know, when I take my kids fishing for the first time, we go to grandpa's lake and we catch bluegills off the dock, like one after another. And we end it with them wanting to fish some more. So short little sessions are good for young dogs, but I think you can take them shed hunting, especially if it's a relatively because it's a short window of time like i'm i'm just starting we found our first shed today actually of the season so i push it off later because i don't shed hunt a lot of public land i i primarily hunt private land and i don't want to bump deer off and literally this week i've talked to multiple people that said close to half of their deer they figure still have their antlers well i don't want to be bumping those deer because they're going to shed any day and i don't want to be pushing them off onto the neighbors so I personally, my goal, and I, I think the reason we have the success we have from a shed hunting perspective is we set our places up to be late season havens. Plenty of food, plenty of cover, no pressure. So until they're all shed out, I don't want to go, uh, those sheds aren't going anywhere. Uh, do you risk a little bit of some chewing? Yeah. So do, if you want to look early, I don't have a problem going early. Now this is a shed hunting thing, but I don't have a problem going early, but I'm not going to go into bedding areas. I'm going to go into like food sources that the deer aren't in in the middle of the day anyway. So I'm not really bumping them. I'm not going to go push into the cover though. So that's me personally. So I think that you can and should take dogs when they when you have opportunities for shed hunting because you only have so much time to experience and give them opportunities um you know i'm learning a lot with this pointing dog on the importance of giving her an opportunity to succeed as a bird dog like that's that's heavily from a hunting perspective that i think is the majority of my duty as a handler it's not to teach her any of the stuff it's to give her opportunities and so as a shed dog trainer, I can relate to that because in order to be a good shed dog, the dog needs ample opportunities to put two and two together to equal four. Training, simulating isn't going to do it. I think the same can be said about tracking. Tracking dogs can gain stuff out of some simulated lines, in my opinion. If you set up some tracking lines for your dog, some training lines for your dog, I do think that there's value in it for your dog, especially early on and just kind of putting these pieces of the puzzle together and understanding it's a, a game of, you know, hide and seek. And, and I, I think that brings out their natural abilities. I think the more, the bigger value in training a dog for tracking with training lines is for us as trainers to understand how to read our dog and understand when they are or aren't on a trail, understand body language, understand their their quirks, the things that they do well, the things that they struggle with, better understanding of learning how a dog process is sent because we can assess like different different environmental things, weather, uh, wind, um, pressure, all this stuff can can help us better understand how our dogs process scent. I think that can be said about a lot of training. So the training is for the dog, but it's not like we're retriever training and putting hand signals in like hand signals are not natural for a dog so that requires us to like condition the dog and shape the dog to behave the way we want which is not necessarily in their dna the tracking dog the shed dog when it's hunting when it's quartering and casting and finding antlers we can simulate that stuff in training but it's not the real thing so the best way for a bird dog to develop into a bird dog, whether it's a flusher or a pointing dog, is have opportunities. Same with shed dogs. Got to have opportunities. And unfortunately, 
it's a lot more challenging, I think, to put dogs in those positions to succeed, which is why it can take a long time. It can take several seasons before light bulbs turn on enough where it really, in my opinion, turns into what we want from a hunting dog standpoint, shed wise. So yeah, I, I think I look at this question of what do I do first? Part of it is predicated on the calendar. So I would look at this and say, your new blood honed puppy is coming home in April. So could you work on antler stuff between now and September? Yeah, for sure. You could shape condition some stuff. You could work on some retrieving. You could work on the scent. But I also think that it'd be April 2nd is coming home. So let's say it's two months in April. So May, June, July, August, September is five. It'll be seven months, first to September. Well, between September and October is probably going to be, the depending on where you live, the first opportunity to put a dog on a track. So I would make sure that from September, October, November, December, with a seven, eight, nine, and 10 month old puppy, I would use that window of time to get as many opportunities to put it on actual tracks as possible. I wouldn't necessarily shy you away from like training lines in the summer. I think you should. I think you should prepare it because I think you should have an understanding of what the dog looks like when it's tracking. And then take advantage of the next three, that three or four month window. And then by the time that you get through December, the dog's say 10 months old. Now you've got January, February, and into March, another three months where I would shift my focus and I'd start looking at, I really want to be prepared for March, April. That's probably it. You know, depending on where you live, March, April, May, to be able to get in the woods and do some shed hunting. So I do use the calendar as a way to structure my training plans based on in 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 dictated by the dog's age and, and where they're at with training. I mean, right now I've got Chief. This is a, an example that's somewhat similar, but maybe a little bit different. But Chief is my son's dog, 11 months old. He he's gonna bird hunt with it. So he was obviously, maybe not obvious to some, but he was way too young to hunt this last fall. Eight months old, nine months old, way too young. So he's 11 months old right now. And so I could tell Mason, you know, you've got, you've got March, April, you know, March is almost halfway done. So you got April, May, June, July, August, you got five months. That's going to put him at 17 months. So he's almost a year and a half. This fall, will he be ready to go out and do some of that hunting stuff? I would expect he will be. I wouldn't say for sure. He, he's not right now. He's nowhere near it. Uh, he'll make some simple retrieves. He's pretty steady for the controlled situations that we put him in. Uh, we need to, he needs to do intro to gunfire. He needs to have an intro to birds. He's got to have an intro. He's got to be, he's got to have a little more control on him in the field. Like, is, is recall is very good. Uh, does he have to be able to stop to a whistle? He should. Does he need to have hand signals? Uh, I think he should be started on stuff, but I think that to expect him to be really proficient at it at 18 months, 17 months, no, I don't think he'll will be. Um, but will he be, I think my goal with him would be prepare him so that we could take him in the field this next season and get something positive out of it. And some of it might just mean make really simple retrieves in the decoys and be steady, be patient, be quiet. That might be it. Like, I don't know that it will be handle on blinds. I don't know that it'll be uh, work, th work through multiple birds and, and leaving dead birds to pick cripples. And I don't know that he'll be ready for that. Maybe he will. But I don't know that I, I look at it as I need to be prepared for that. I look at it as we need to get next step, the next step done in order to get to the next step, which will get us to the next step, which will get us to where we ultimately want to be somewhere down the road. It's going to take a couple seasons. I, I really believe in the idea of developing. And the reason is because of opportunities. You know, hell, I, I was on, I was on some duck hunts this last year, not a ton of them, um, enough to, to, work my dogs a little bit and, and enjoy it. I had a lot of fun, but I don't know my dog. If uh, we had Callie this last fall. And so we worked some upland stuff, a, a lot of upland stuff, more upland stuff than we did gun dog work, but she had an opportunity to retrieve a handful of dogs. 
Well, she's not a duck dog, not after retrieving a handful of ducks on 10 hunts. I mean, we took her out to North Dakota for the opener. That was probably the most action she got. She did really well. But after that, and so she probably, I guess maybe she retrieved a few more than a, a dozen or so, but she made some nice retrieves early on, but not a ton. And then throughout the rest of the year, she picked a bird here, she picked a bird there, she picked a herd bird. But so is she a is she a duck dog? She's a duck dog in the works. Are you gonna have a tracking dog by this fall? You're gonna have a tracking dog in the works. Next fall, you're gonna have a tracking dog in the works. Next fall, you're gonna have a tracking dog in the works. Same with my duck dogs. I, I, I don't say that to like put someone down or make them think that they're not doing it right. I just look at it as you're never done. So we really need to take that pressure off of ourselves. There's no reason for you to put pressure on yourself when it comes to that stuff. You got, you got 10 years to develop them. So it's more fun when you don't feel that pressure. That's why I love training my own dog. That's why I love training dogs the way I train them for other people. I don't train them with any type of commitment of, hey, I'm going to have them for this amount of time and they're going to be to this level. I don't do that. I know some trainers do and that's fine. I don't. So my business, our business isn't built that way. So I train my dog like I think most people at home train their dogs. And that is slow and steady wins the race as far as I'm concerned. So there you go, guys. I got three Facebook questions answered. I'm going to send these guys some emails. Uh, thank you for listening. I appreciate your support. Do me a favor. If you enjoy these, uh, if you could subscribe to our podcast, if you're listening to this for the first time, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, if you would leave us a review, different podcasts have different review places. I really appreciate, I've gotten a nice little push of people on Apple Pod and um, I don't know what the other ones are that people listen to them on, but Ben would know. But if you could leave us a review, a rating and a review, that really helps because it allows us to be able to get in front of more people. And I think... Um, Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do is help as many people that are training their own dogs, whether it be for their retrievers, whether it be for their tracking dogs, whether it be for their shed dogs, whether it be for uh, Makina, following the Makina series with our setters. You know, I, I, I think one of the best things about what we're doing there, and if you're new to, if you're not, if you don't know, on our training library on our website, there are, there's playlists and there's tons of videos. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of videos, um, series of dogs that we've been training. We've got multiple series starting right now. Makina is full swing. Uh, Chief is going to have a nice little mini series. Um, I've got two puppies that we are going to train litter mates. We're pretty excited about that. We're going to be some contrasting comparing of two litter mates where I'm going to be training a little male out of the litter. Ben is going to have a female. The beauty is, is we're going to see some comparisons and, and differences of the two puppies. We're also going to see comparisons of two trainers because Ben is going to train his dog. He's not getting the old man here to train it for him. So I am going to train it with him and I'm going to train mine and he's going to watch, but he, we're going to train him to train his dog as well. So I think it's going to be another layer, another way for us to connect to folks that are watching and training their own dogs because uh, Ben is very much kind of in that boat. I really need to do it with my son, but it's hard to do when he's you know three hours away. So I'll take what I can get when I got it. Um, and that's the, the week, this week here that Mason's on, on a beach somewhere and I'm training his dog for him. So, uh, I appreciate you guys. This is, that is what we're trying to do is help folks that are listening at home, um, bring some benefit to them. You can hear the little puppies maybe in the background dreaming and yipping and, um, some really fun stuff going on here with our dogs. And I'm, I'm just excited more and more with everything we do, uh, as far as, the the ability to share it with you i just i'm really grateful for the opportunity for you guys to listen and follow along so thank you for that i really appreciate it and we'll talk to you soon <laughs>